the last uh, part of the program. We have uh, the final keynote, um, and it will be delivered by Professor Desmond O'Neill from Trinity College Dublin. And uh, this is a uh, terrorism, uh, I guess specializing in or kind of your, one of your special fields, the strokes, and all the results. But that would be sort of an understatement to say that that's your field. I just, this morning I forwarded you a, a queer theoretical paper that was citing this as analysis of James Bond to the Skyfall. So that maybe gives you some idea of the breadth of, of, the, of this as interest. But, uh, yeah. Very cool. Come. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Anna. Anna, it's uh, really wonderful to be in Denmark. I love visiting and I love visiting the Nordic countries. I always tell my colleagues that the very best gerontology congress in the world is the Nordic Gerontology Congress. You have a wonderful esprit de corps, you have a wonderful in engagement, and very little by way of friction between the various branches of gerontology. So I hope what I'm not talking about today isn't totally, totally old hat to you. But I think it is very important that we as geriatricians and gerontologists think hard about aging and about our own aging and where we fit in in terms of society and values and attitudes. Is it on? Maybe. Good. Okay. <laughs> And uh, being Irish, we tend to speak very fast, so if I speak too fast, somebody make a signal to go slow, more slowly. But you're all, we're all time impoverished here. We're balancing work, we're balancing family, academia. And one of the more interesting um, <clears throat> calculations around the increased longevity we have compared to our grandparents is that compared to them with the increase in longevity, We've actually been given a 29-hour day if we have the same lifespan. We've been given an extra five hours a day. So for time impoverished people, what a gift. Now obviously, we've been giving it later on, it's like higher purchase, but it is a very, very important thing to remember is this gift we've been given. And yet, there's a, a deep-seated ambivalence in society about it, and there actually is, I would contend, among ourselves also, and ambivalence about what aging means for each of us. So the essence of what I'm going to try and cover in the next 45 minutes or so, I have slightly too many slides, but some will be rather quick, is first and foremost, do I recognize the longevity dividend that which we have gained personally, family and society from aging? Secondly, do I welcome my own aging? And we've heard today already about aging being very gendered, and it is complex, but do I welcome the fact that I'm aging and growing older? And lastly, can we reconcile our existential vulnerability with the longevity dividend? And I was delighted that Agneta mentioned the selection of the socio-emotional selectivity theory, because as I'll cover that briefly during the talk, it also contains the element that our fragility and vulnerability are actually very much the agents of that which makes us strive for the most meaningful in life that it's actually an important bonus. And I'm going to be talking a lot about art and creativity in later life, and one of the great exponents here was Gene Cohen, who talked about late life creativity not happening in spite of old age, but happening because of old age. And it's the most rich, it frustrates me so much, because now it's the richest time of life. As one of our gerontologists, Strickforth, is, uh, we're, we're, we're born copies, but we die originals. <laughs> and I have to say, I adore working with older people. I find it absolutely fascinating, and I can never understand. We've passed the stage in Ireland where people say, oh, it's great to for you to be working in geriatric medicine. But in many countries, people have a negative stigma about career entry. And particularly, for example, gerontological nursing is the only branch of specialist nursing in Europe that doesn't have a European association. So very low profile. So this, unfortunately, is the classical societal response to aging. So this appeared in English and Irish newspapers, and in a word it says this resistance to age-denying, age-defying. So if you want to say, less vital, me, never, and you want to take your vitamins, that's fine. But this encapsulates, really, the tolerance we have of negativity towards aging. And it comes out in much more uh, worrying forms. We've published a paper in the BMJ about ageism and the economist. So the economist is the weekly newspaper 
are most widely read in parliaments around the world by people who make laws and change policy. And it's unremittingly negative. This cover in particular uh, uh, troubled me because I'm going to talk about the economic longevity dividend. But it's untrue in two camps. First and foremost, not thanks to oldies, the world's economy isn't threatened and China's prospects are stagnating. But even more worrying is that that's nice that dear, as if older people don't care. And in fact, if you look at studies around recycling and the green um, movement, it's actually older people who are better at recycling than younger people. They do care what they're leaving behind. And much of this falls back to the man who coined ageism, and these words still remain true, Robert N. Butler, an extraordinary polymath and geriatrician. I was delighted to get to know him towards the end of his life. But the tragedy of old age is not that each of us must grow old and die, but the process of doing so has been made unnecessarily and at times excruciatingly painful, humiliating, debilitating, and isolating through insensitivity, ignorance, and poverty. And again, these issues still remain. So we've got a problem around how we view and construct ageing. And this, where at my particular area of interest, I'm guilty of, as Anne was perhaps kindly saying, of academic promiscuity. So I range over a range of subjects. But my particular interest is around medical humanities, and, and particularly a branch called cultural gerontology. And I think one of the sparks of cultural gerontology comes from a famous quote by T.S. Eliot, that for every issue in life, there were two responses. The first one is, what are we going to do about it? So I'm in the caring profession around older people. For the first 15 years of my career, I had to learn the techniques. But then you get into your 40s and you begin to think, what does it mean and how does one relate to it? And I think they're the questions we have to start asking ourselves about aging. And this is where the art of later life, the art of the longevity dividend is twofold. The art itself is a metaphor, but we have to learn the art of talking of and diffusing the idea of the longevity dividend. And one of the interesting branches of gerontology that you may or may not be aware of that has arisen is that of cultural gerontology. Uh, again, the doyen of this is Julia Twig. She's just published a book uh, a year or two back. And its definition is really very helpful. It's a broad and conflicting usage, usage a tendency, a field, with a central focus on meaning, a desire to transcend old paradigms and to bring a fuller, richer account to later years, redressing gerontology and geriatrics neglect. Because um, if uh, you know, one of the problems is in all of our disciplines, whether it's sociology, psychology, we are very often trapped by a version of what Michel Foucault called the medical gaze. And we tend to see it from our viewpoint. If your only tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And this is about looking at aging through arts and humanities and literature and see what can we understand. So anytime I talk to the medical students, anytime I talk to the general public, I always start with this slide. And I say, when you ask me to talk about aging, I'm going to show you this artwork, which is the Tate Modern. It's three meters by three meters. It's vibrant, it's radical, it's a change of direction, and it's by an 83-year-old. And not only is it an 83-year-old, but it's an 83-year-old with bed bound and chair bound. And this issue of your vulnerability being an engine of change Matisse had had an abdominal operation, something went wrong afterwards, he could no longer stand. His hands and eyes were fine, but he'd always been used to painting standing up. So he couldn't paint. He just found he couldn't sit down in bed. So he started doing his decoupage. And what's really interesting, when people talk about people being a financial burden in later life, uh, I'll come to Leonard Cohen in a minute and I'll explain that, but uh, if you have a tea towel mug of reproduction, it's almost certainly from Matisse's later work. Is uh, decoupage. Um, I put in the Lancet piece here not as part of a new illness called RSP, relentless self promotion, but actually to say that the literature is really interesting. The Lancet is the second highest rated medical journal and they are interested in issues like this. But high art is not necessarily for everybody, and once you start looking for the longevity dividend, you can find it everywhere. So you go to cinema and you find Gran Torino with Clint Eastwood at 78 fantastic director, but also a fantastic portrayal of later life where he's actually not the cutest, cuddliest person in the world, but does the right thing. And talking about technology, there's a wonderful piece where his awful son and daughter-in-law come with the idiot phone for him for a birthday present. It's fantastic. It's a real red flag around uh, technology and aging. Music, Leonard Cohen, 
Look, maybe you like his early stuff like Suzanne and Marianne, but his late stuff was truly fantastic, self-reflective, humorous. And when people say a burden, I say, well, it's not too bad to make $9.3 million on your tour when you're 73. Comedy. George Burns on the left there, famously, he's the man who, when somebody said, well, who wants to live to be 100? He said, that somebody was 99. And he got that far himself. But I actually had to review a paper, a rather silly paper, uh, in some ways, except it showed the ages of older people, which surveyed Finns to ask who wants to live to be 100. And the people in their 70s, being as ageist as the people in the 70s are, said, I'm not so sure. And the people in their 90s said, yes, please. Um, a few years ago, we were at a gerontology congress, a geriatric congress in, in Oslo, and the oldest man in Norway was there, Mr. Falk. And uh, when Edward Hansen um, uh, asked him, um, Mr. Falk, when do you think it's a good age to die? And he said, I used to think 110, but now I think 112. <laughs> and one of the things I really enjoy about working with older people is their sense of humor, is their ability, their stoicism and humor. And Marie, Marie Calmont, who lived to 127, when she was 118, a journalist came to see her and talked to her. He was a big guy, he really enjoyed it. He said, Madame Calmont, can I come back and see you next year and talk again? And she said, I don't see why not. You look quite healthy to me. <laughs> But my students are great, they're, they're very frustrated, they say, oh, that's fine, comedians, old French ladies, but what about real life? Well, here's a bunch of politicians who made a difference in later life, very often taken out of retirement. Go to my ear, de Gaulle, a porn in the side to the Allies during the war, uh, magnificent in later life. Uh, Reagan, Churchill, disaster at Gallipoli, uh, victorious in World War II. And I have to say, Field Marshal Mannerheim, my own favourite, coming out of retirement at 72. And you know, uh, both the winter wars, the continuation war, quite, quite extraordinary. And managing the feast would be the only democracy that fought with the Nazis. And uh, the story around himself and his birthday and Hitler is worth knowing if you don't know about it already. So, quite extraordinary social skills, enviable. But it goes into practice, that's fine, politicians, but what next? But uh, Anu and I are very interested, and Anu and Choi are very interested in the drivers, who, despite having the most disabilities, are the safest group of drivers. And if you want to come down in the Hudson River and survive, do you want a 25-year-old Ryanair pilot with really good reflexes and really good eyesight? Or do you want this man with less good reflexes and less good eyesight? And this is around challenging the idea that well, they have these disabilities, so they must be less effective, they must be less worthwhile in some kind of way. And it is the gift that keeps on giving. One of the extraordinary things about older people is their altruism and their awareness, social cognition. So if a child is in a car with a grandparent, as opposed to the parent, and there's a crash, you have the risk of serious injury to the child if they're driving with the grandparent. You know yourself at dinner table discussions about ch children going with the grandparents. This is, like most of gerontology, it's so counterintuitive, but it's true. But there's also an economic longevity dividend, and, and, and Kevin Hughes in Chicago is one of the first people to tease this out. And because very often the economists come from either tax averse governments or pension companies that want to take even more of your money, we tend to hear apocalyptic demography. But in fact, Kevin Hughes has shown that 3.2 trillion a year to the US economy, bonus of 1.3 million for each US citizen, and uh, UCL and London have repeated the study and they reckon that the A Aging has bought 40 billion extra for the UK economy, everything from inheritances to change of work patterns. In the Irish Longitudinal Study on Aging, 23% of adults over 50 had sent over 5,000 euros down to their adult children, but only 9% of the under 50s had sent it the other way. So the danger is we allow ourselves to be sucker punched into this area here. And again, Axel Borch Supan, running share, which Karen is uh, the medic had been medical lead on. Uh, has these wonderful paper demolishing the myths of old age that necessarily implies declining living standards, the economics of aging is about the old, declining health limits the capacity to work at all older ages, retirement is bliss, older workers less productive, and keeping older workers creates unemployment in the old. All untrue. Marvelous studies around older roofers, the people who work up on the tiles, and they take longer to do a single tile, but they do the overall job faster. They have less accidents. They're really, really interesting. So one, what I would say is that this is an area whereby, so how do we get around this? And one of the areas is through incorporating cultural gerontology. So for example, one of the examples I had, I was very fortunate, our National Theatre Company 
decided to do a midsummer night dream where all the actors were over 60, some were over 70, and some were over 80. And for example, some of them were, were, were a bit disabled, so they couldn't quite fall down. And it was set in a nursing home. And instead of worrying about your daughter getting married, you're worrying about your mother getting married again. <laughs> but one of the nice things of working with cultural, with, with, with humanities and arts people is very often they can tease out the important message. And what I loved uh, around doing this work is that I wouldn't have picked this sentence out, the editor did, is that once we glimpse the inner life and complexity of older people, we cannot retreat to a vision defined by their disability. And it's how we can incorporate that into our everyday work. And don't worry, I am coming to the bad news as well. <laughs> so whenever I go to a museum or an art gallery, I'm always looking for a uh, late life creativity. So what might we find if we went to Denmark and looked for aging, <coughs> apart from the right hand side? Um, well, Hans Christian Andersen, the most incredible thing he thought was the finest thing he'd written, and was written at the age of uh, 65. Uh, Karen Dixon at the age of 73, uh, Anecdotes of Destiny. Uh, Bertil Thorvaldsen, if I get that right, uh, at 74, quite extraordinary in a way. The Genius of Sculpture was one of his last pieces. Talk about leaving uh, a fine testament of uh, later life. Uh, in the Scalen painters, Anna Anker, what I particularly like about her later paintings into her 60s is with her husband there as well as an older artist creating and painting. So no matter where you go on Hudson, at the age of 87, with his son designing this wonderful uh, centre in Oldenburg. So, and finally, although he was sometimes Danish and sometimes German, Emil Nolde and his ungemalte builder in his late 70s, early 80s, extraordinary, extraordinary paintings. And Grundvig, active to 89, still rising, quite extraordinary, impactful, current affairs, what with the Greek Revolution, quite, quite extraordinary. So you have this portfolio here of magnificent older creativity uh, in Denmark. All right, but the danger sometimes, some of you may know there's a famous American novel called Pollyanna, and Pollyanna is this girl, no matter what bad thing comes, she sees the silver cloud, lying into the cloud, and she sees moral improvement. So we have to accept that our existential vulnerability is going to happen, most obviously, and uh, you know, statistically most likely, during our later life. So give it to me straight down, how many golden years have I got staring in the face? Well, what's really nice about it is the artists also give us insights and clues here. And this is something which I think again relates to the socio-emotional selectivity theory. And it also relates to a broader uh, theme in, 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 in thought, particularly Susan Sontag's illness as metaphor. And she has this lovely phrase that illness is the um, dark night side of life or more owner citizenship. We all hold dual citizenship. So where they, as the disability um, uh, sector now, they don't talk about the able-bodied, they talk about the presently able-bodied. And But it's impossible to take up residence unprejudiced by the lurid metaphors with which it is landscaped. So that if people think negatively about these things, it affects the services. And as you all probably know, if you as an older person harbor negative images about aging, if you are ageist, you actually do less well in hospital, you progress less well in a whole range of things that actually damages you internally as well as affecting the services you might receive. And the other area to turn to is particularly not only um, this, uh, Carson's and socio-emotional selectivity theory, but I direct you towards Martha Nussbaum, um, um, uh, her wonderful book, The Fragility of Goodness, where she explores how, uh, in terms of strength and trust and virtue, actually they're really all based on fragility. So um, uh, there is this constant theme that our fragility is important to us, it's important to be faced up to. And actually, she explores it through Greek tragedy. And I'm also going to bring it through somewhat through the portrait of Thomas Tronströmer, who had a very major stroke which affected his speech and his ability to play the piano with the right hand, but he went back with his uh, left hand. But his poetry shows some of this impact of, our, of understanding our vulnerability and of bringing us closer to the meaning of life and what, what we are. And again, I'm very mindful of the danger of being Pollyanna like, so don't worry, I work all the time with older people. This is so one of the great places to start, and again, I have I put some references to this, and I'm happy for the slides to be distributed, just to show that the medicine is interested, the wider 
the wider community is interested. So one of the fascinating, sort of turn to older people and ask them about health and health care. So um, Dr. Seuss has written two books for older people. This is one for, for adults. This is one of them. His other one was about Lady Godiva. Um, but, um, and he complained in his 80s that his, he had a number of illnesses and his social life had become confined to doctors. And what's really nice about this book is it shows the type of depersonalization and disempowerment that happens to older people when they go into hospitals. But he is telling us, I'm still here with color and humor. So it's utterly fantastic, a book for obsolete children. And even got into polypharmacy before we ever thought about it. It was truly wonderful. I take three blues at half past eight to slow my exhalation rate. On alternate nights at 9 p.m., I swallow pinkies for a bed. But Edvard Munch, his, one of his last portraits, self-portrait of the clock, is really quite extraordinary for the range of messages it gets. And this is where the arts and humanities allow us. They're very potent metaphors that allow us to see things at, at several levels. So at one point you can see a thin man on his own with a single bed. But actually there's bright colours that interest you. It's a great artwork, so he's asserting himself. You may notice that the clock has no hands, so where is the relativity of time? And the pictures in the background, many of them are of his conquests. So there is a life, sensuality, erotic memory. We're getting a hold of a lot out of this painting. Goya, in his late phase, um, uh, one of uh, if anyone has been to the Prado, has these dark paintings that are supposed to be indicative of depression, but we're getting human expression. And they are savage, they are dark, but the story continues. And this is the danger of defining people by their disability. His depression lifted, and he spent much of the rest of his life painting gorgeous translucent miniatures on ivory. And in fact, if you look at Tom Gill's work on the epidemiology of longitudinal studies on older people, it's not a straight downwards line. There's people that come back up when you go back to see them two or three years later. So again, it's not about an inevitability of decline. And who better to tell us than artists, and for artists of a very sharp, sharp eye. But then, uh, what's great, I have medical students are never very feisty. They say, that's all very well, prof. But, but what about life with dementia? And indeed, here, again, I have to say, I'm really, really interested in dementia. It's probably where I started. It's something that's been in my family that I'm fascinated by, and I'm fascinated by the internal life. And we have three wonderful metaphors for dementia, for creativity, that should impel us to look f deeper and further. Um, um, uh, the Kooning on the right um, is uh, the great Dutch American expressionist painting, painted extraordinary painting, it's quite different in his early Alzheimer's. Uh, Terry Pratchett. Um, the wonderful fantasy writer developed a posterior version of, of Alzheimer's. He was a visiting professor at our university. He could still write by dictation, but he couldn't sign the dedication on a book. So it's about us supporting people that do this. And Ravel composed his Valero and both his piano concertos while he lived from the temporal dementia. And this is what the Welcome Foundation in London, which is a big medical humanities centre, did last year and this year has a focus on creativity to unlock um, what is inside, to understand, to make joy out of life with dementia. And one of the, uh, the people there is Seb Crutch, who had this wonderful paper in the Lancet that sometimes a workman can play his tools. Because we're interested in medicine and narratives that people can tell us of their illness, but clearly with dementia you get memory problems and language problems, so you can't write it down or tell it. So Uta Molin is a very famous uh, portrait painter. And he painted self-portraits of his progression through dementia. And this is truly wonderful. And it actually reassures me as a physician that the nearly top-ranking journal of medicine wants to know about this. So take heart. There, 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 there is a place and a space. And what's interesting about the paintings to me is all those are degradation clearly and technical skills. They've all got an artistic integrity. They've all got something. They, they grab you and uh, they hold you. And again, I was talking about Thomas Transformer, and again, I think what was really interesting for me is how it's difficult for me as a doctor at Samoa to talk about people coming through on the other side and having learning more about themselves. So when the poet or the artist or the musician tells you. So after his stroke, he had this, these wonderful poems. He had a longish gap, and they took up playing the piano with the left hand. Indeed, when his um, Nobel Prize was awarded, they made a CD was of him playing the piano with the left hand. 
some recordings of him speaking his own poems before the stroke, and then other people speaking the later poems, which are nearly all quite short, haiku-like, and uh, that he clearly is telling us about his journey through stroke in such a short, short poem. It's truly, truly wonderful. And again, I can leave you to, to, to read it yourself. Um, where you catch a glimpse of the sun and hear the cherry trees humming. Truly, truly uh, fantastic. So, coming back to ourselves, because they say charity begins at home, so welcoming AG and the longevity dividend should begin with us. And I assume everybody here has a special interest in older people or would like to learn more. And one of the interesting things that strikes me is how little we as geriatricians and gerontologists write about aging. And, and, um, Moon Choi showed a copy of the gerontologist. I, I didn't add it in the slide, but I'll talk about it briefly in a minute. So this is from the first textbook of geriatric medicine by Ignaz Nasher. Now it's a fabulous book and there's lots of insights in it. But look how he describes aging. And do you think that that's his aging? We realize that for all practical purposes, that the lives of the aged are useless, that they are often a burden to themselves, their family and the community at large. Their appearance is generally unesthetic, their actions objectionable, their very existence, often an incubus to those in their humanity or duty, take upon themselves the care of the aged. So, well, that was 1914. Have we improved? Well, the answer is somewhat up to a point. So we did a survey in 2012. We're very fortunate. My library is able to get every book that's published in Britain and Ireland, and a lot of books in the US. And one of the things that bothered me as I read textbooks on aging is when we talk about normal cognitive aging, they only talk about the losses rather than the gains you make, wisdom, altruism, social cognition, the things that make you not crash as an older driver. So we looked, and sadly, 87% of textbooks of gerontology and geriatric medicine only talk about the losses of cognitive aging and not the gains of cognitive aging. So it's really kind of sad. So we have, we have a problem. Okay. Here's uh, just one more example. Here's a, 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 a paper from New England Journal of Medicine where old age psychiatrists were saying how sad it was that people wouldn't join their profession because of ageism or whatever. But look how they describe aging. They talk about the underside of the silver tsunami, but there's no upside, there's no good thing about a tsunami. So if they think aging is a tsunami, don't be surprised that people don't want to come and join it, rather than saying, I have a different phrase that you might join when you're looking at recruitment. So we're going to have to change. There's very, very little published in a reflective point of view. Bill Hazard, the geriatrician in Seattle, has written some really interesting things about aging. And Atul Gawande, in his book on being mortal, has one chapter which is about a geriatrician in a retirement home. It's a really nice metaphor. Otherwise, the gerontologist, we hardly talk about it. There was a special issue of the gerontologist about what aging meant. And it was a heart-scalding disappointment. Because rather than the gerontologist saying, well, now that I'm 55, I'm really getting a mastery of my subject, and I'm really enjoying it, and they all talked about the illnesses of their parents. It was actually depressing. It made you realize that actually, as gerontologists and geri geriatricians, people are actually almost certainly at best ambivalent about aging. And we really need to start looking at the language we use as well, not killing the longitudinal, the, the longevity dividend by inappropriate language. And one of my favorite papers of the last decade was from, I'm sorry this didn't go into a higher ranking journal and be seen everywhere, because really, the problem with successful aging is anything with success has got a KPI, so if you don't meet the KPI, have you failed? And if you're frail, have you failed? So optimal aging is definitely one that puts, again, we were talking earlier, I think, through Anna's work about what the person, the client thinks, optimal is what I think is right for me. In the same way, I haven't been a carer of myself. I really object. Now, obviously, things have a, a trajectory. But I object to what I was doing for my mother, being called a burden, a carer of burden. There were burdensome aspects of care, but actually, I wanted to care for her. And Arthur Kleinman talks about the moral importance for our development of caring. So actually, if we call it care a burden, go figure that the people we work with also think of it as a burden. So, coming towards the end, the good news is, is there's people out there who get this. And one of the, one of the people who get it 
are the artists. They're definitely the stormtroopers of consciousness, if that doesn't sound too pretentious. So um, I was particularly taken, if, if there's one film I recommend people see about aging, it's Pixar's Up. And it's truly stupendous. It's a Trojan horse of positive gerontology around the longevity data. And he's cranky. And he's cross. And he's not easy to deal with. Um, and, but, but it also shows wonderful small things like that thing where on his quadruple walker, he puts the tennis balls to make it more, more, more solid. But it's truly wonderful. It shows that combination of tough but frail that increasingly characterizes people in the 21st century. And, and these films are just pouring out now. Coco recently was again about a grandmother. I mean, that's who the, part of what the film is about. About a great grandmother. It's a fantastic uh, movie to talk about intergenerational transfers, death, memory. Absolutely wonderful. And the tide is slowly turning, I think, in terms of, of the discourse. I'm not saying that it's perfect. But one of the things I was delighted with a group of geriatricians and gerontologists to get into place and to get onto the front cover of the Lancet was that aging is most often framed in negative terms, questioning whether health services, welfare provision, and economic growth are sustainable. We argue that instead of being portrayed as a problem, increased human longevity should be a cause for celebration. So this really, I, I think, what I would say is I think this is an important strand of scholarly activity that we as a group need to develop, need to nurture, and it doesn't mean that we don't do the important work around welfare and support and disability, but it, it must be in the context that what is our role? So what is our role? Rather than being the underside of the tsunami, I'd like to think that we are the guardians of the longevity dividend, and that we've been given a really privileged job. We have this fantastic, fantastic um, gift given to us, late life creativity, the contributions of older people. And again, one has to be very careful about not getting into productiv productivist or uh, over hypercognitive mode because people are important in themselves. But some funny thing happens in that most of us have warm feelings towards our mother, our grandmother, our grand uncle, and yet all of a sudden there's this wall and there's older people, not us as we age. It's as if it's a different uh, group. And I think it's really important that we need to, each of us, start thinking and generating a dialogue, and more of a dialogue in our literature around what we think about aging. I'm delighted in a way I was very fortunate. I knew all four grandparents. They all had dementia when I was a youngest child, and I never saw them as anything but full people. It taught me the lifelong lesson that most people with dementia do not get behavioral disturbance. I could see my parents' distress as well. So that's my, my grandfather on the steps of the house there when getting married. That's my parents, my, my, and I, my, they've given me permission to talk. My father got very late perioperative cognitive impairment, but he was still able to maintain a good conversation, good relationship. And my mother, from nine, at 88, she bought her piano to get back to playing the piano. But around 91, she developed dementia. And we had two really wonderful years where we, we engaged with each other in a very different sort of way, and I was very appreciative of the experience that I had, and I've got to put myself into that picture. So you can tell my age by the type of crown. <laughs> Alright, so lastly, just a personal, what I found really fascinating, I don't think I was big into poetry as a younger person, but um, what has increasingly interested me is the poetry of later life. Um, and I think I found a key here, W.B. Yeats, our great poet, talked about of our quarrels with others, we make rhetoric, of our quarrels with ourselves, we make poetry. And ageism is the most bizarre of prejudices, because we're not going to change race. Most of us aren't going to change our gender. So racism and sexism are against other people. But ageism is a prejudice against our future self. So I think, by t so what I hope through this talk is I've given some insights into ways that we can recapture at the longevity dividend. And I think particularly to poetry, I have to say I found it, I find particularly wonderful and concise sentiments. So this is Thomas Kinsella in his 80s, and I'm particularly in one of the things if I get another 10 or 20 years working, one of, I'm very, very interested in sexuality in later life, not just around the genital acts, but the whole process of sexuality, and particularly how little we think about erotic and sensual memory. We talk about other memories, but maybe one spouse or partners doesn't want you to. <laughs> to go down that route. 
because this wonderful one catches Thomas Kinsella, a legendary figure in old age. I saw there a number of elders in intimate companionship, their old shapes without shame, playing with one another with all that remained of the barbed shafts of love. And I heard one of them saying to those around her, we cannot renew the gift, but we can train them with the last drop. <laughs> and that rings so true with what I do. Also, a sense of a familiarity, but not being overwhelmed by death. And I have to say, I, I love this um, um, from, from Tronströmer, from the Great Enigma. Uh, death stoops over me, I have a problem in chess. He has a solution. It just, it suggests an awareness, but not, not being subjugated. And this is what I find hugely. One of the cliches I hate most in my practice is what older people want is quality of life, not over quantity of life. I have to say, they want both. Us as we age, we, we tend to want both. And finally, and that before I come, the Irish always have the last word in a dispute, sorry, argument, so I'll come to it. The last one of the Irish, but um, Cheswaf Miwash has this wonderful poem on reaching his 90th age, which catches this simultaneous growth of a gloss. Not soon, as late as the approach of my 90th year, I felt a door opening in me, and I entered the clarity of early morning. One after another, my former lives were departing like ships together with their sorrow. And the country, cities, gardens, the bays of seas assigned to my brush came closer, ready now to be described better than they were before. So coming to this issue of loss, I have to say, um, Samuel Beckett was the great writer about the imperfection of language and how much slips between the cracks. That's what it all his work is about, is that constant struggle to express ourselves through the, the frailties of language. So I love this quote. This would be my number one quote. I always thought old age would be a writer's best chance. Whenever I read the late work of Goethe, W.B. Yeats, I had the impertinence to identify with it. Now my memory's gone, all the old fluency disappeared. I don't write a single sentence without saying to myself, it's a lie. So I know I was right. It's the best chance I've ever had. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think, I think there's a number of theories that come together around Jero Transcendence. Um, uh, Butler's late, late, late Life Review, where you begin to make sense of things, so it's not... Uh, so I, I do think there is an element of Jero Transcendence, but I, I, I struggle with where, where it fits in with maturity. Okay. You know, in a way, it's, it's, continue, it's continuing ma ma maturity. It's also, uh, I think, a freeing of oneself. What you see with the great artists, particularly, is very helpful, is they begin to care much less what their peers think of them. So if you take Foray's late nocturnes, all uh, artisans' late paintings, their peers didn't value them at all, but they didn't care. Titian kept painting, and Foray kept making composing his nocturnes. And yet the late nocturnes now are seen as that they're very sparse, they're very spare, they're very stripped down. So part of it may be a realization of, the, of, of how much it matters, what your immediate peers think about you, and what happens to the next generation. Yeah. So no, I think it's a useful concept. Stimulating thoughts here, here to the audience. So we have to really think about it. I'd like to, to 
the, the link with art as well for, to a large degree. But it always uh, also uh, um, brought to my mind this uh, uh, theory of selection and optimization by Baltus and Baltus. Uh, yeah. You know, the very early beginning of the 90s, I guess, as back as then. And uh, how is it happen? How can it happen that we kind of lost this? A view on uh, the positive sides of aging and that um, optimization can also be a strategy to uh, well, yeah. to deal with with the losses that we have. Yeah, no, it's, uh, again, I'm not sure if people don't know that uh, this is Baltus and Baltus, Paul and Margaret Baltus. They developed this theory looking in nursing homes how people engage successfully with their environment. And what they found was that they selected the things that they would do, they optimized them and they compensated. But it spreads out in artistic life as well. And one of the examples, and he said this before, he had never met Paul and Margaret about his Arthur de Rubinstein, the great pianist, who um, continued playing into his 90s. And when he was in his 80s, somebody asked him, uh, Herr Rubinstein, how come you continue to play so well? Well, he said, um, and he did selection, optimization, compensation without knowing he was doing it. Uh, he said, well, I select the pieces a bit more carefully now, so I don't play the really, really difficult ones. He says, I optimize, I practice much more in my 80s than I did when I was a young man in my 60s. <laughs> but this is the genius of our big life, and this is the sort of thing we just don't measure. In a lot of healthcare things, we talk about being salutogenic and, and measuring the positivities and what people can do, but we're still very disability focused.